All right, guys, welcome. Here we go, another Ask Gary Live Google Hangouts. Today I'm in the backyard. If you hear any noise, it's probably from my little guy who's sitting right across from me. He's doing some coloring, so maybe he'll come on camera at some point. Hope you guys are having a great week, and I want to thank you again for joining me. If you're at work and, and playing hooky, that's awesome. If you're not, then that's cool as well. And we'll, uh, we'll get right into it. But before we get to the questions, again, if you're on the Hangout with me, um, make sure that your mic is muted so that unless you're asking a question, there's no feedback or anything else. And if you do want to ask a question, just unmute yourself if you're on video with me and just, you know, pose away and, and I'll, I'll be sure to communicate with you over video. Um, if you want to join me on the blog, you can go over to urielkeem.com and find, I'll actually post the link um, on there as well in the Hangouts. So, you know, you're giving a couple different options for hanging out with us. We have obviously the blog where if you're not on video with me, you can ask questions by typing into the comments and I'll answer them as we go through the video. And then obviously for the individuals on the video with me, it's all awesome to uh, communicate and kind of do the face-to-face, -face, which is a lot of fun. So um, before we get into the questions, I just want to mention one thing. I sent out an email this week uh, telling you guys that I'm pretty much done with the uh, promotion machine that you're probably all familiar with within, you know, if you're subscribed to anyone's email newsletter list, whether especially within the fitness and health industry, uh, it become, it, it's, it's gotten a little bit out of control. And a lot of the thing is like a lot of the guys in the industry they're, and girls, they're awesome. They're great people. They have great programs, but, and they're great friends of mine, a lot of them. But the problem is that um, you haven't signed up to a newsletter or uh, some kind of free uh, reporter or whatever to be pitched every single day. And I had a lot of time to think about this for the last couple of weeks. We surveyed our clients, like people actually paying us money, not even, not even just our, 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 our community in general. And we found that about 70% of you guys were sick and tired of all the pitch emails. So I, I want to apologize. Well, I'm not going to apologize because that's, you know, it, well, I will apologize to some degree um, because you didn't sign up for that. Um, but, you know, I want you to understand that we did recommend stuff that obviously we believed in moving forward as of July 1st. So as of next week, those external promotions and all the pitch emails um, for external stuff is going to be dramatically reduced. We're only going to be getting behind stuff that I personally use and are, am in love with. Okay, so when I recommend something, you know that it's like 100% you're approved. I'm not going to be jumping in on all, the, all these launches anymore. Um, because, you know, you probably, I mean, everyone's getting everyone's emails, right? You probably get five emails from the same person or from different people with the same email saying, buy this person's, you know, thing. And and that's, you know, that's that's fine. I mean, you know, everyone's wanted to help each other out. But at the same time, it's just, uh, it's not the way we want to build our business. So I want you guys to let, I want to let you know that that's going to be a big change moving forward. I want to thank everyone who filled out our survey about two months ago to give us that feedback because, it's something that we felt internally, but I think having that, that concrete evidence was really eye-opening, so I want to thank you. So it's going to be uh, onwards and upwards, and uh, it's going to be some, some awesome stuff we've got coming for you. A lot more of these hangouts where I'm able to engage with you and answer your questions and connect with you live in person, uh, virtually, and then a lot of great stuff we're going to be doing over the next uh, couple of months and years and so forth. So let's, uh, let's open this up to anyone on the hangout with me on video. Um, does anyone have a question you want to start off with? And if you want to chat, just hit the unmute button on your dashboard somewhere there. And if you don't, that's completely fine as well. You can post a question in the chat area. And Tina is asking, okay, what are the benefits of coconut oil? That's a great question. Coconut oil is amazing. I actually had a soccer game last night. Before I left the house, I had about three tablespoons of coconut oil. So you might be asking me, okay, why on earth would I be having three tablespoons of coconut oil before a soccer game? Well, first of all, coconut, let's, let's look at the health benefits before the performance stuff. Health benefits of coconut oil is uh, it's, it's antibacterial, antimicrobial. It's pretty much anti-everything. Okay, so from a uh, just kind of a clean, you know, germ killing type of thing. Coconut oil is awesome. If you have any wounds on your skin, uh, scrapes, cuts, stuff like that, you can apply the coconut oil topically. It'll help with the wound healing process. Now, in addition to that, coconut oil is a saturated fat. It's one of the only saturated fats in the plant kingdom because normally saturated fats come from animals. 
this is one of the rare exceptions. And the beautiful thing is that it's a very stable cooking oil. So if you're using, uh, I've talked about this a lot, a lot, if you're using vegetable oils like canola oil, corn oil, soybean oil, those are the real deadly oils that we really should all be avoiding, especially when we're cooking. Coconut oil is very stable when cooking. So that why that's important is because oils become rancid when we heat them, and that becomes a very, very, very dangerous thing in our body. So coconut oil, like butter, is a saturated fat predominantly, and because of that, it's solid, right? It obviously becomes liquid at room temperature when it's heated, but because of its saturation, that makes it more stable to heat. Okay, and that's a very important thing with cooking. So if you're going to be cooking, you want to use coconut oil or butter for the most part. Those are the two best kind of greasy fats to use when you're frying, when you're baking, uh, because they're, they're the healthiest from a cooking standpoint because they're the most stable and because they actually have really good benefits, right? So the health benefits of coconut oil, other than the fact that it's anti-everything and it's very stable at um, high temperatures, is that it contains... A couple of things, I'll talk specifically about one of them called MCTs or medium chain triglycerides. Essentially what these are, these are a medium chain triglycerides or a medium type of fat which the body actually uses as a fuel. So it actually burns these MCTs like it does carbohydrates. So MCTs are not really stored as fat in the body. So this is from a performance perspective why I took three tablespoons of coconut oil last night before my game is that in terms of a lot of studies have shown that ultra endurance athletes will use coconut oil to give them sustained energy and that's because coconut oil is transformed it's actually utilized uh, as fuel but it can also be transformed into ketone bodies which are more readily utilized by the brain and, uh, and that's a very very good thing for focus and so forth in sport so uh, tremendous benefits uh, I Coconut oil, we pro I think we probably have about three tubs in our pantry right now. And every single day, I'll just open it up, grab a tablespoon, boom, give it to my kids. They love it as well. And then we use it for, for cooking purposes as well. So coconut oil, uh, it's an unfortunate that in the mass media, like I mean, on Dr. Oz and stuff, you, you see a lot of these people using like spray oils and, 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 and canola oil for cooking. It doesn't seem like this is getting to that level yet in terms of its mass awareness. So hopefully it will, and uh, when I appear on Dr. Oz, I'll be sure to uh, to bring that up with him as well. Thank you for your question, Tina. All right, so again, if you guys have any questions, you can post them in the chat on uh, the Hangouts, or you can pop on video with me just by unmuting your mic and asking your question. Uh, in the meantime, I'm going to go over to the blog. I'm going to take a question from the comment section, and Jacqueline wants to know, um, I have terrible cravings for chocolate at certain times in the month. What healthy alternative is there, or what can I do to stop the craving? I have now in my kitchen tubs of almonds, walnuts, and fridge banana, but sometimes they just don't hit the spot. The smoothie, which I love, is two bananas, one tablespoon of peanut butter, two dates, uh, a scraping of carob chocolate, two cups almond milk, but I can't drink that all the time. Ha ha. Okay, so basically, what do you do to overcome chocolate cravings? Now, when she said at certain times of the month, I would assume that probably it's when she's menstruating. I would, I would guess, just based on what a lot of women tend to tend to talk about with respect to chocolate. And with that, I mean, it could be it could be representing something else. I mean, it could be when you're losing blood, you have an increased uh, demand for. For instance, uh, commonly, you know, magnesium. Okay, magnesium is one of the most abundant minerals in chocolate. Uh, but I don't know if that's really the big thing at play here. I think obviously there's hormonal issues that are at play, which affects everything. Hormones really affect everything in the body, as you know. And you know, the best way, again, the best way really to get over chocolate is to go cold turkey. I mean, that's that's the reality, right? You can't. You can't wean it down. I mean, you can, but it's it's still lingering in there, right? You're always going to crave what's in your blood. So one of the best ways, actually, of overcoming that is by drinking green juice. I drink green juice at least once a day, and it's probably the most effective way to cut cravings across the board, so whether it's chocolate or sugar or anything else. And the reason for that is because green juice has a very purifying effect on your blood. Okay, It contains huge amounts of chlorophyll, so if it's green, you know it contains chlorophyll. Chlorophyll is the pigment found in green plants. And chlorophyll has the same molecular structure as hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is in our red blood cells and they hold oxygen. So when you drink greens, you're essentially 
giving your blood a transfusion of awesomeness and it's very very powerful at cleansing out your blood and that's really important because um, simply by reducing chocolate consumption you need to look at okay how do I it's not about removing stuff right it's about replacing stuff so if you take the chocolate out what's gonna go into its place so when you have those cravings for chocolate you need to have some kind of alternative so if you have a green juice lying around that's awesome right you'll just you know quickly get that in and you'll feel great about it um, but I really firmly believe that in order to get over chocolate cravings you really have to stop eating chocolate and the easiest way to do that especially if it's at home is don't even buy it don't even allow it to come into your house because if it's in your house that's rule number one if it's in your house you will eat it it's only a matter of time so I mean I enjoy chocolate Amy enjoys chocolate and one of the big things that we've changed probably in the last six to eight months is we don't even bring it into the house anymore because we used to have you know healthier chocolates kinda of sitting around in our pantry but we knew they were there and in those kind of moments of weakness it's very easy to turn to that and and get that little you know square or, or entire bar in some cases it's a lot more work to physically leave your house go to the store get the chocolate bar and eat it I mean if you're at that point it's you're kind of possessed by chocolate so most of us wouldn't go to that extent of oh my god I'm about to get out of my house drive to the store and then get the chocolate bar some of us you know in some easiest way to do that especially if it's at home is don't even buy it don't even allow it to come into your house because if it's in your house that's rule number one if it's in your house you will eat it it's only a matter of time so uh, sorry my mic just got muted for somehow all right so anyways um, yeah so don't bring it into the house really it has to be cut out cold turkey I really believe that and you need to look at replacing chocolate with other things I mean if at the very minimum uh, look at uh, fruit right if you have a craving for sugar from the chocolate have an apple instead have a pear have whatever it is and I also want to mention one thing about the smoothie that she mentioned she talks about two bananas peanut butter dates uh, chocolate and almond milk okay that's a lot of sugar in that smoothie right there the two bananas and the two dates that's like a glucose fiesta and just to give you an idea like a date is one of the most pure uh, forms of glucose very very quickly uh, assimilated into the blood as in blood blood sugar and if you stop eating those kind of foods or v I mean really limit them bananas and dates as an example you'll find that your cravings for sugar goes down because again you're not eating sugar so you crave them less or you crave it less uh, I've rarely ever eat bananas anymore I used to eat bananas like they're going out of style we just put them in all, all, all of our smoothies and, and all this other stuff and now I rarely ever eat them and when I do I really notice it. I really feel like just like that that sugar has hit me, and so I really minimize uh, the consumption of bananas. So, uh, Jacqueline, I hope that answered your question. I think you know the key again is really about minimizing sugar intake because if you minimize your sugar intake, you're not going to crave sugar. Okay, remember you crave what you eat most often, or you crave what's in your blood. Okay, let's go back to the hangout. If you guys have a question, you can unmute yourself and join me on video you can also post a question directly in the chat box and in the meantime I will pop over to Facebook see what's going on over there okay I, so every Friday I ask you guys to post a, a corny or a funny joke on Facebook I want to just share one or two of them here because maybe I'm gonna compile these into a huge blog post or something they're they're just corny and funny let me find a good one here for you guys in the meantime um, okay so Connor says I didn't like my beard at first but then it grew on me ha 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 difference between beer nuts and deer nuts beer nuts are a dollar and 69 cents deer nuts are under a buck ha 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 so I mean corny jokes like that they're fun you know we have a little bit of a laugh with them so if you have any of that kind of stuff, be sure to post them on our Facebook page on Fridays when we, when we ask you uh, for those corny jokes. All right, so we'll see if we've got any relevant questions here on Facebook. Oops. All right. Okay, so Amanda wants to know, just wondering, uh, so she has candida, like a lot of people, use fungal infection, no sugar, no weed, and yes, I've stuck to the change of lifestyle since I was 30. Because I ended up with psoriasis all over my body, depressing to all extent. 
But anyway, I drink every day red wine, mainly in vodka. I work long hours, so my question is three wines a night okay with eating healthy exercise. I just think I'm 40 now, and I want to lose about 10 to 15 kilograms, but want to do it slowly. Okay, so I think you pretty much answered your own question there. You, there's a lot of golden nuggets out of that question. So she talks about having candida and yeast infections. Uh, fungus, yeast, candida, it's all the same. It's all part of the same kind of bundle. So, and she's saying that she's not eating sugar, not eating wheat, and she's stuck to the change uh, of this diet. Uh, since she was 30, she's now close to, she's now 40, so that's about 10 years, so that's great. But she still has issues, I guess, with that. And she wants to lose weight. So the first thing is she's saying that she drinks three glasses of wine, red wine a night, and she drinks vodka. So right there, right, let's just stop the car right there. Okay. So you're cutting out sugar, you're cutting out wheat. So that's tremendous. But you need to cut out the wine as well, okay? Wine is a huge culprit. Alcohol is a sugar, okay? Wine is a big contributor to yeast, candida, and, and fungal issues. So you need to cut that out. If you really want to get rid of the candida, if that is the issue, the red wine needs to stop. And especially three glasses a night, that's way, I mean, that's like half, of, that's more than half a bottle probably. Cardiovascularly, one glass a day is considered healthy. Anything more than that becomes a risk factor for heart disease. And this is, you know, it's, we're not talking about heart disease, we're talking about fungus, candida, yeast. If you want to get that stuff, at, you know, kept at bay, you need to get rid of the alcohol. I mean, I, I, you know, I was just doing a, a filling out some forms for an insurance thing, and they're asking me how often I drank, and I was trying to think, I don't know, maybe one glass a month? Like, that's probably the most I drink, and that's just a personal decision of mine, but I, we don't drink at home. If I go out, maybe I'll have a glass of red wine with dinner, but three glasses a night is way too much. So if you really want to lose 10 to 15 kilograms, you really have to be, uh, you have to be just realistic with yourself and say, hey, what is it that I'm doing right now that is sabotaging my efforts? I'm drinking three glasses of red wine a night. Okay. So those, first of all, you're getting a lot of empty calories. You're getting a lot of alcohol in and alcohol is processed in the liver in a very different manner than glucose. So it actually feeds into VLDL or triglycerides. Uh, so it's not good for, obviously, for, for cardiovascular type stuff. Um, but it's not going to help you lose weight. So I would say dramatically, obviously, cut that down to at least one glass of red wine a night at the very minimum um, in terms of cutting it down. If not, just cut it out completely. Have a glass every every couple of days if you can. I mean, if there's there's reasons why you're drinking, right? You're obviously saying you, dr you work long hours. You're probably stressed out. Alcohol might be your you need to kind of go to de-stressor, you need to find alternative means of doing things. You need to find, go for a walk, do some meditation. I know it sounds, it's, it's all been said before, um, but oftentimes it's the stuff that we hear over and over and over again that is the stuff that we need to apply into our lives, right? I'm not here to really give you groundbreaking stuff all the time. Um, I'm kind of like in the reminder service of saying, hey, reminder, this kind of stuff is not going to help you towards your goals, right? So uh, get that down. Exercise is obviously important. I have no idea what you're doing for exercise, but exercise is going to be important. It's not going to be the most important thing. The most important thing when it comes to losing weight is what you're eating and what you're not eating. Okay, so really, really remember that, Amanda, and uh, thank you for the question. All right. Um, Brian Hardy was saying, I don't think my mic is working. I tried unmuting myself, but I don't think you can hear me. Uh, I actually... Brian, I think you actually muted me a couple minutes ago. That's why we had that little uh, blank out. So I'm not too sure there. Um, there should be a little icon somewhere on your screen that says mute mic. And I think, I mean, I, again, I don't, I, I've only used Google Hangouts so many times. I'm not a very techie person. So I wish I could help you out more on that. All right, let's go back to the blog. We'll take another question here. Uh, this one is from Karen. So she wants to know, can you recommend, one, uh, nutritional supplements on top of green drinks and plant-based diets to improve debilitating symptoms of Sjogren's syndrome? And I'll share what that is in a moment. Uh, and two, best exercises for someone who's inactive with painful joints, generalized osteoarthritis. And number three, a good Toronto specialist for bunion removal. Okay, so I'll just get rid of number three. I don't really know of any good bunion removal person in Toronto, so I can't really answer that. Let's go, we'll work backwards. The best exercises for someone uh, who's inactive with painful joints. 
the, I would, I'm just kind of assuming this might be related to question number one because question number one has to do with Sjogren's disease. And just to let you guys know what that is, Sjogren's disease is really, it's, it's an autoimmune disease where the body attacks the salivary um, mucosal lining of your body. So it, your body has a tough time reproducing um, mucus, so the mucous membranes dry out, you're, you have, you're uh, you have a tough time, you get dry eyes, flaky hair or flaky skin, uh, hair loss. So again, we're seeing more and more autoimmunity and why is that happening? Okay, so she's asking for a supplement other than green drinks and a plant-based diet to help with it. And Karen, the reality is that, and I'll talk about the exercise in a second, the reality is that there is no supplement that's going to help with that. Because if I were to tell you take vitamin C or take whatever, I would be very dishonest of myself because that's not dealing with the problem. The problem starts internally, most likely at the level of your gut. Okay, Because if you think about how autoimmune disease starts in the first place, it really all starts with leaky gut, which means that your gut has widened pores which now allows large food particles to seep into the bloodstream. And when that happens, you have bigger food particles and different proteins that the immune system now says, hey, this is a foreign thing, we don't know what it is. And when you do that all the time and you get these constantly mounted immune responses, over time your immune system gets worn down. And we know that this happens with gluten, that's a big problem nowadays. So the first thing I would say is you need to correct the digestive issues. So looking at things like digestive enzymes would be a helpful start. You have to look at correcting the leaky gut, which is, um, again, it's, it's, it's beyond the scope of this, of this video. Um, but digestion is very, very important. So a very basic kind of starting block would be to chew your food properly, use a digestive enzyme to support the digestion of those foods. And first and foremost, uh, after that, is to cut out gluten 100%. So no gluten, no wheat, nothing. That needs, when, you're, when we're talking about autoimmunity, we have to get rid of gluten absolutely indefinitely. Okay? Because gluten, in a lot of cases, is one of the big culprits for a lot of these autoimmune disorders, including my own. Okay, So cut that out 100%, and that's going to allow your gut, and it's, again, it's at least a three to four month period until you're going to start seeing changes because your gut needs time to reduce the inflammation and repair itself. Then you can start looking at things like omega-3 fatty acids like fish oil because they're anti-inflammatory. They're going to support the anti-inflammation process in the gut. Okay? So Sjogren's is just one example of what can happen when leaky gut and all these digestive issues eventually lead to allergies which eventually lead to autoimmune disease. So this, does, this stuff doesn't happen overnight. I mean, you wake up one day and you don't Obviously, you feel very different, but it's years in the making. Okay? And you have to realize that it's not a, a lack of one mineral or nutrient or supplement. In a lot of cases, it is a systemic problem that is taking years and years and years to develop. So we need to correct that and understand that it's going to take some time to reverse that damage. Okay. Now, the second question is the best exercise for someone with painful joints it's like, like again, it's tough to say. Like you have to find things that are going to be good for you. So I would the first thing that comes to my mind would be swimming. So if swimming is good for you, then swimming is awesome because it's very low impact, and that would be awesome for someone with joint issues. I would suspect that a lot of that joint pain would go away as you start moving gluten out of your diet, as you start allowing your body to repair itself. Because I have a very sneaky suspicion that the joint pain is related to the Sjogren's in some way. Okay, so thank you for your question, Karen. And I know it's obviously not the magic bullet answer you're looking for, but this is the stuff. These are the kind of answers you need to be aware of. I don't want to lie to you. I want to be completely honest with you. And you have to be honest with yourself to say, listen, this is going to take some time. I commit to making these changes um, because if I want to feel good, this is what I have to do. All right, so do we have anyone on the uh, Hangout here who has a question on camera? I just figured out that I can mute you guys. So if I hear you guys making noise, <laughs> unless it's a question, I can mute you. So I think I just muted Laura. Uh, Laura. So Laura, if you have a question, just unmute your mic. Uh, I just I just threw some background noise in there, so I wanted to just kind of cut that out. Um, but you can always unmute yourself if at any point you have a question. 
All right, so I'm back on the blog. I'm going to get to the next question. Okay, so Dave is asking, do you have a green drink you recommend, such as Athletic Greens? I find I have a difficult time being consistent in getting my greens blended. I'm wondering if there's a better alternative for me. Would it be to mix up a green drink? Okay, so this is a great question, and I actually have a really good recommendation for you guys, but it's not even ready yet. It's not, by not ready, I mean it's not ready to market yet. So... I will, Athletic Greens is, I've never actually personally used it. I've seen the, I know a lot of people do. I've seen the label. It's, you know, packed full of, you know, green good goodness and all that great stuff. It's, you know, got a decent reputation. It's about 100 bucks a month. I don't know if I'd want to spend that on green powder, um, personally myself. Um, I have a, so anyway, as I was mentioning that I, I'm using currently a greens powder, which is tremendous. It's a combination of uh, wheatgrass, barley grass. It's got some spirulina in there, some other awesome stuff. And it comes from a friend of mine who's developed uh, just a tremendous reputation for a lot of the stuff that he's done. Uh, with, with And again, he's a holistic nutritionist as well. And he's going to have that ready to go hopefully within the next couple of weeks. I'm actually speaking to him next week. We're going to be doing an interview on my uh, Super Nutrition Academy Health Class podcast about greens and green juices. So uh, be sure to, if you're not, if you, if you haven't downloaded my iTunes podcast, go to iTunes, type in Super Nutrition Academy Health Class, subscribe to that podcast because uh, we're going to be doing a pod, uh, the episode next week, which will come out probably in a couple weeks, uh, will be specifically about those green kind of mixed drinks. Uh, because there's a lot of them out there. Some of them are good, some of them are bad. I'll tell you one thing, though. The one thing I can tell you is that if you are looking for one of those greens powders to add into water and kind of mix it around, is look for one that is green juice powder. What that means is that they've, for instance, juiced the greens, and then they freeze-dried it, and then they turned it into powder. And the reason that's important is because when you add that to water, it dissolves very easily. The alternative is very commonly found, and I would say 80% of most green powder supplements, is that they just pulverize and powder the actual green, uh, the raw greens like that. So it, it becomes very fibrous. When you put it in water, you're constantly having to mix it because it always just, it never, it never um, assimilates properly. So green juice powder versus green powder itself. And you can see that on the food label, the, the ingredient list, it'll say uh, green juice powder from XYZ, and that's, that's the best one you want to look for. But again, I'll let you guys know. I'll put it up on my page of recommended resources. It's awesome. I currently use it. I have it inside. I would get it, obviously, if I wasn't here with you, and I'd show you. But we'll save that maybe for, for another call. All right, so thank you, Dave, for the question. Um, again, if you guys have any questions, okay, I'm just answering a question from Brian. Again, he's having some mic issues. That's all good. I'll just answer your question here in the chat. What is your opinion on uh, the benefits of obtaining a bachelor's degree versus taking certifications in holistic health coaching and personal training? It seems that a lot of what you learn at university is more complicated than is useful and is more suited towards pursuing academics and teaching. Okay, so here's my thought on, uh, on formal education. I would say don't let formal education get in the way of your learning. Okay, don't, don't it, or I guess don't let school get in the way of your education. And the reason I say that is because I went to University of Toronto for four years, studied kinesiology, had an amazing experience. But I can tell you um, to this day, I don't, I, I mean, obviously I use more of the, the stuff that I learned because I'm actually applying this and, and kind of helping you guys with this stuff. But I would say about 80% of the students that I went through school with are now teachers. And I can guarantee you that they don't use close to anything near what we learned in physiology, exercise physiology, anatomy, and all that stuff. I would, I love those courses. I love exercise physiology. I love um, all that stuff, but I really don't know, and it really depends, Brian, on what your goal is. Uh, you know, is, is your goal to work with clients? Is your goal to become, have an online business or develop content and put out stuff like kind of what I do? If that's the case, you don't need a degree. You don't need anything. You could set up a website and start, you know, rhyming off whatever you want. That's the catch-22 of the, of the internet is, you know, anyone can set up a website and just, you know, say stuff. I don't really know that there are many certifications out there that are really valuable uh, from a nutrition standpoint. And that's one of the reasons we developed Super Nutrition Academy. We're actually coming out with a certification in the next couple of weeks. So stay tuned for that. 
because the Super Nutrition Academy certification, having that accreditation is not going to make you a nutritionist, but it's going to really hold a lot of weight as SNA gets out to a lot more people on a big scale and they realize how powerful uh, what you guys are learning is really in terms of um, having a real good understanding of how the body works. Personal training certification, sure, that's, I mean, it's good. I, you know, I, I've known trainers who have taken weekend courses and I've known trainers who have done their PhDs and they're still working with clients and they're still helping them lose weight, you know. Um, I, don't, I don't think that it's the level of education that's what's important. It's, I think it's your ability to help people, whether it's um, in a one-on-one -on -one setting or, or on, a, on a bigger scale through disseminating information. So, um, yeah, uh, I think, you know, university can be good, but again, remember, university is very, it's very, it's kind of in, it's in a box, very, you know, like this. They try to train you to get a job, not necessarily to help you think outside the box and do things on a, on a bigger scale. Like the stuff that I'm doing, if I were to go back to the University of Toronto and say, hey, listen, I want to teach a course on entrepreneurship, kind of 2.0, They'd be like, well, where's your PhD? Where's your master's? So I'd be like, well, I don't have one. I don't care to have one, but I can show you my track record. I can show you the number of people that I've helped outside of the traditional mold of, you know, getting a job and doing all this other nonsense. So that's, uh, those are my thoughts. Uh, so just kind of following up here saying, I definitely like to end up with a situation like yours with clients, uh, as well as uh, online business, eventually switching to mostly online as to achieve more freedom. So thanks a lot for your input. Yeah. Honestly, I would really, first of all, um, that's awesome, and I think we need more people like you who's, who are willing to step out and, and put this information out there and help more people. And, I, I, you know, I think don't, learning is very, it's a very self-directed thing, I believe. Always be learning, always be growing. Every single day you need to be improving yourself, you need to be learning new things because if you're not learning new things, then you know what value are you bringing to the world? So even if you're not going to pursue a degree or a university path, you have to constantly be reading books, learning from others, seeking mentors, all that stuff is very, very important. And I think that's probably more important in terms of real life application than what you're going to learn in school. All right, all right. So Oscar is in the house now. He's throwing the little. We have a little air. I don't know if you guys saw a little airplane fly over a couple minutes ago. That was Oscar throwing the uh, styrofoam airplane that we have around the backyard here. So. <laughs> all right, Oscar, you want to come say hi? You want to come say hi, buddy? All right, Oscar is going to come say hello. Uh, there we go. You want to show them your plane? Can you say hi? <laughs> so Oscar has the wings of his plane. Obviously the plane is not intact right now, so it's not flying. But we'll put him back down so he can keep throwing his plane around. All right. Um, again, if you have any questions, guys, throw it into the chat. You can also ask me live on camera. Just unmute your mic. And we'll see if we got any other questions popping up on the Facebook or if we have anything else on the blog. Uh, I'm just going through here. Uh, dun, dun, dun. Okay, I've got a, an exercise question from Milka who is asking, does combined exercise burn more calories considering considering I use the same intervals intensity and all that, except I use many combined exercises in my routine. For example, I will do shoulder pike press, then turn to reverse plank, and do 10 quick crab kicks, and then again turn into shoulder press as opposed to splitting this move into two, and do them in separate time intervals. So I don't know if that makes, I don't know if that makes sense to you guys, but essentially what she's saying, I think, is that can you use a combination of exercises as a form of interval training? That's kind of what I got from that to burn calories. And the answer is abs absolutely yes. There's really no right and wrong. I mean, there's there's no right and wrong way to exercise. I mean, if you work, if you exercise, you're doing your body a benefit. There's better ways and less effective ways of exercising. And that's what I hope to uh, share with you guys is obviously the better ways. 
so she's talking about different exercises. We don't have to go into the specifics of them, but just understand that interval training is doesn't have to be running or biking, you know, quick, slow, quick, slow. Interval training can be done with anything. I mean, I could I could just do an interval training workout in the backyard with kettlebells. And I'll often do a lot of my workouts back here with a kettlebell and bodyweight stuff. So you can call it circuit training. You can call it interval training. It's essentially bouts of intense exercise and then low intense exercise. So for instance, kettlebell swings, 30 seconds, and then jog on the spot, 30 seconds, okay? Kettlebell swings, 30 seconds, jog on the spot, 30 seconds. Then you can throw in some other exercises. You can do a circuit, kettlebell swings, push-ups, lunge walks, bodyweight squats. All of those exercises would form a circuit or a workout of, of kind of smaller intervals, and that's gonna help you burn fat, right? Because it's all... Okay, Oscar, Oscar, quiet it down for a couple minutes, buddy. All of those exercises will help, and remember the key is the more overall full body type stuff you can do, the better off you're going to be. So the more muscles you get involved in an activity, so if I do a bicep curl, okay, I'm getting a very small limited range of muscles involved in that activity. That's why my body doesn't warm up. That's why a bicep curl is not a very metabolic activity. It's not going to burn a lot of calories. It'll strengthen my bicep, but that's about it. If I do an exercise where I'm lifting a weight from the floor to above my head, or I'm doing a kettlebell swing, which is a very full body exercise, now I'm going to start getting a, a feeling of heating up inside my body, which means that now I'm getting more muscle involved, it's more metabolically active, and that's going to burn more calories. So if you do those kind of activities set up in a proper fashion, like, uh, like the stuff I just mentioned, that's going to be very, very effective at helping, uh, helping you lose weights and obviously burning calories. Um, okay, so I'm going to take two more questions. I'm just going to finish up with Brian here. He has uh, one more thing to say. In terms of offering nutrition advice, is there a legal risk if you make certain claims? If I offer services as a health consultant, does that protect me from potential liability? Again, I, I really don't know. You have to talk to a lawyer about that. Um, I can tell you from my standpoint, I'm dropping the CK from after my name. So CK stands for Certified Kinesiologist. I'm actually dropping that because the Ontario Kinesiology Association is now enforcing, um, uh, I don't know, enforcing or uh, overseeing or whatever it is. Uh, they're basically regulating what kinesiologists can do and say. So for me, I don't really practice kinesiology. So why would I even, I don't even care about keeping the CK behind my name if that's going to limit what I'm able to share with you guys, right? So if I say stuff on a video here and then the Ontario Kinesiology Association comes and says, hey, Yuri, you said this, uh, now we're liable, so we're going to, you know, whatever, chop you down, I don't want to have that happen. So I would rather be able to express my knowledge uh, without being regulated by a certain board. And that's why a lot of doctors have issues because they're regulated by their boards uh, in terms of what they can say. So obviously I'm not putting out ridiculous information. I don't think you should either, but you definitely want to consult with a lawyer about that because those are some, some kind of great areas that uh, you want to iron out. All right. Uh, one last question. I'm just going to go back to the blog, see if we have any other comments. Um, da -da 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 -da. Okay, uh, another exercise question. So a really quick one here. If my main workout is, uh, this is coming from Yavuz, if my main workout is static stretching as opposed to core strength or cardio, do I need to bother with dynamic stretches? I will be warming up for five minutes on a treadmill, so should this be enough? So that's a great question. I think you got it, um, you know, bang on there. The whole idea with static stretching is that it's, it should be, static, static stretching really should be done by itself. Like, not before a workout, not even after a workout to a great degree. So if you're going to literally like do a yoga session, which would be a form of static stretching in a lot of cases, you just want your body to be warm and then that is your session. You're just static stretching and that's it. The reason you don't want to do it before your workout is there's a lot of different reasons. We've talked about this before. It does not prepare your body for the activity. It actually slows down your nervous system. It increases your risk of injury, uh, reduces performance, all that great stuff that you don't want to have happen. If you do it after a workout, you have to be careful because you've already strained your muscles during the activity. So if you've played a sport or lifted weights, 
your muscles have now created, there's micro damage at, at this very, very, very microscopic level. If you stretch, you can make that worse. So light stretching, foam rolling, that kind of stuff, active recovery after a workout is best. Before the workout, dynamic warm-up, dynamic flexibility, dynamic exercise is the way to go. But pure static stretching, where you're holding a stretch for 30 seconds or longer, should be done by itself on its own after your body is warm. Okay, so I think if he's hit it right on the head there, he's going to warm up for five minutes, get his body warm, and then he's just going to stretch. That's the perfect scenario for that. All right, guys? So with that said, we will end off this episode of Ask Yuri. I want to thank you guys for joining me, and we will continue to do these at different times to hopefully uh, to hopefully attend to different people around the world in different time zones. I know obviously at 10 a.m. most people are probably at work. So there we go. I hope you guys have a great day, and if you have any other questions, you can always join me on my blog at yurielkim.com or over at Facebook. Just type in Yuri Kim if you're not with me on Facebook for whatever reason, and I look forward to seeing you guys uh, very shortly.